Thanks for uh, coming out today. Um, I, I think we all know and we can agree that you know energy is a hot topic right now. Whether if it's you know electricity with your local utility, natural gas, oil, gasoline at the pumps, diesel on and off road, um, kerosene, propane, it, it's all over the news. Whether if it's Con Edison, National Grid, um, you know a lot of it has to go back to what happened with this winter and the cold winter what's going on in New York State specifically with, um, you know, renewables and our push for renewables and sustainability. So we're gonna touch on a little bit of that, um, what's going on in, in New York and what we expect happening in New York State going forward. Um, we'll also touch on a little bit about what's going on overseas and how that's impacting everything here locally. What's going on post pandemic, because a lot has changed Pre-pandemic to the post-pandemic, not only, you know, with the cost of energy, but, you know, the cost of cardboard, lumber, everything like that. So the cost is everything is up, including energy. Um, it just happens to be right now is just a really, really bad time and energy is kind of you know, number one on the list. Um, so we're going to go into a slide and just talk a little bit about, you know, United States, you know, breweries in the United States. Um, you know, we have a report um, from the United States Brewers Association. <laughs> Um, and breweries throughout the country spend about $200 million a year on energy cost. So again, you know, one thing, in, in, and in past presentations I spoke about this, but, you know, breweries are, each brewery is unique. You have, you know, breweries with a tap room. You know, you'll have, you know, I like to use Millhouse as an example because I'm in the Hudson Valley, but uh, Millhouse has a, a brewery with a restaurant, but they also have um, an off-site brewery center with distribution. So their energy needs are going to be different than, you know, let's say Evil Twin Brewery down in Ridgewood, Queens, where, you know, they just, they don't have a restaurant. They have, you know, a tap room with a beer garden and their brewery. Um, also, they're in a different utility in a different zone. So um, some people are brewing with electricity. Some are using electricity and natural gas. Um, so regardless of your, your different needs and the, the, the type of brewery you are, um, it's, it's, it's a big bottom line cost in your operating budget. Um, and there's different things that you can do, um, not only sustainable wise and renewable wise, but to make your operation efficient. So on the next chart, what, what we kind of wanted to show and, 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 and specify is that electricity is number one with what breweries are, are using as far as power. Um, a lot of it is cold refrigeration and then just normal operations, okay? Um, you know, certain breweries are in certain areas where there's no natural gas, so they're heating with oil, um, but they're not, you know, their, their kettles are working off of electricity. Or they might have a whole complete electric brewery system. Um, then you have breweries where that, you know, their kettles can be he heated with natural gas um, and they have a restaurant, so they're using gas constantly throughout the full year. Um, and they'll have a flat natural gas load. But regardless, every brewery is consuming um, as far as the one energy component, it's electricity that is number one. So in this pie chart here, um, I kind of wanted to show the difference between, you know, brewers, um, you know, natural gas consumption and electricity consumption. 
Um, just so you guys also know, we can email you this presentation directly. Um, we think it's important um, not only to you know prospective customers and customers, but with breweries and just businesses in general, our job as energy advisors is to empower you with education about how your business uses energy and when you use energy. That's the biggest thing. Everybody says, oh, can I get a better price or am I more efficient because I use more electricity than him or her? And it doesn't really work that way. It's about, part of it's how much you use, it's when you use that energy and how efficient you use it to what you potentially can demand. And I'll get into that later with your KW or your demand. But as you can see, you know, natural gas, you know, the number one um, component there, it's, it's actual brewing for, for natural gas. It would be a little bit different if you were a restaurant and a brewery. Um, and with electricity, it's, it's refrigeration and cooling. I am going to hand it over to the more prettier person in this duo, and Lindsay will stop. Oh, come on, dude. He's the beauty, I'm the brains. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to uh, start by touching on a little bit about our company and kind of where we came from and what we're all about uh, before just jumping into some of the sustainability stuff, um, just introduce ourselves here. Um, so Marathon Energy is a supplier of electricity and natural gas, um, among many other things. Um, we also supply liquid fuels, um, propane, heating oil. Um, we're involved in assisting people with things like getting set up for solar installations, community solar, um, electric vehicle charging stations, and also demand response as well. So um, we're kind of like an all-encompassed company when it comes to energy solutions. Um, David and I are the directors of sales. I'm for the central New York area and David's for the eastern New York area. Um, we've been in operation for over 25 years now. Um, I personally have been in the energy industry for about 13 years um, in a number of different aspects. Um, so, you know, we're really looking forward to speaking with you guys today. We'd, we'd be happy to answer questions later if you have any. And also we have a booth um, right upstairs, right at the top of the elevator if you wanted to catch us afterwards. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, getting the most efficiency out of your processes. And then later we'll talk about um, not just energy savings, but cost savings as well. Um, so there are a few classic measures that you can take within your facility to be more efficient. Um, a lot of these are kind of like, um, you know, easy enough um, common knowledge really, but it, it's just more of like creating a habit uh, between yourself and your staff members. Um, so a lot of these things are just like turning off equipment when it's not in use, um, shutting doors. I know a lot of breweries, especially in the summer when it's nice, they like to keep their doors open to be more welcoming to the atmosphere. Um, but really all your air conditioning is going right out and it's not the best efficient me measure. Um, on top of that, you know, you can also do equipment upgrades as well. Um, chillers, HVAC. Uh, lighting upgrades. I know at this point, probably a lot of a lot of you guys have gone to LEDs because you know that was a big push a number of years ago. Um, but if not, you know that makes a big difference. And then just re reviewing this with all of your staff, um, signage helps uh, just to remind people to shut down equipment when it's not in use to be more efficient. So we've been noticing uh, a pretty big shift to sustainability since 2020, really. Um, a lot of that had to do with the pandemic and the way that we've all had to make adjustments. Can you guys hear me okay too? Okay. Um, to make adjustments to the way that we're doing things. Um, but it's actually led to a more um, consciousness of sustainability, sustainability for our businesses. 
I know in places like um, Mexico City, for example, when the pandemic started, uh, they had to shut down public transportation. And because of that, there were a lot more people riding their bikes. Um, so because of that, they took advantage of that situation and created a whole infrastructure for bike riding to cut down on emissions. So things like that are causing us to think more on the sustainable level. All right, there was a 2020 study that was conducted uh, by the Boston Consulting Group that shows that many more people are thinking on a more sustainable mind level. 70% uh, are more aware now than before 2020 of the importance of sustainability. And 40% are actually putting things into action um, and making the changes they need uh, to make to be more sustainable. So we're noticing this on a global shift, a US shift, and also a state level as well. Um, so with the global shift, I, I know it's hard to see because this is very small, um, but the blue sections, uh, the light blue and the dark blue, uh, those represent solar and wind. Um, so this chart goes from 2009 to where the predicted amount of utilization for renewable resources for electricity generation should be in, I believe that's 2026, which is the last bar chart there. So it's going to be heavily solar. I know offshore wind is a big thing as well. Um, so you can see the trend now and where it's expected to be in the future. Again, this is great, um, but as you guys might know, you know, renewable resources cost money. Oh, and I have a joke about wind energy, but it blows. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll leave the humor to Dave from now on. Okay, so this is more the national and the US shift. Um, so you can see that Fossil fuels is still, you know, on the way up, and it will be. Um, we've got Marcellus Shale that leads to the most of that. We have an abundance in the United States that we've been able to take advantage of um, since fracking started, which has really helped to drive down pricing because of the abundance. Um, but you can see that renewables, the green line, is on its way up as well. And nuclear, um, which in New York State we have a good abundance of, that's kind of uh, flatlining at this point. Um, a number of nuclear power plants have been decommissioned just because they're non-compliant environmentally. Um, Indian Point is one of them most recently. Um, but renewables is on the rise. Um, and basically the the focus of this is all from the Biden administration that has some very strong goals to limit emissions in 2040. Okay, and now we drill down to the state level. The state level also follows along with the Biden administration goals for zero emissions by 2040. Uh, currently, we have the main generating sources for uh, electricity as natural gas, nuclear and hydro. So we have Niagara Falls, a lot of hydro there. We still have a good amount of nuclear power plants. Actually, the nuclear power plants a few years back were given a subsidy to keep them up and running. So we had a good amount of supply for electricity generation. Um, so supply is not the issue in the United States. Uh, we have to kind of consider where the supply is going. So it's not all staying domestic. Um, it's not all being used by us. Um, actually, within the past few years, it's been a, a huge uptick in exportation of natural gas. So it's being exported as liquid natural gas. And, uh, you know, since everything happened with Russia, this is just kind of in the forefront right now. Um, it's being exported specifically to the European states that aren't able to get it from Russia anymore, and also places like China as well that are paying a premium for it. So it's leaving our domestic supply. And of course, in New York State, coal is being phased out as well. Okay, so 
as you can see, it's important to see if you can integrate um, these sustainable uh, strategies into your business. Um, this can help you enhance your brand, improve your energy efficiency, and also keep you buying local as well if you're using um, New York State or uh, local renewables. So a few ways you can go past just the classic examples of what you can do within your facility to be more energy efficient. Um, you can also utilize solar, and there are a couple ways that you can do this. So you can utilize solar by actually getting solar panels installed on your facility. Now this might not be the best um, depending on how your facility is set up. Um, it's all dependent on your roof pitch, the location that your roof faces, uh, tree cover, and also just general aesthetics. Um, not everybody wants to have the solar panels on their roof. Um, but if that's the situation for you um, and you wanted to explore other options but still utilize solar, um, there's also community solar available as well. So these are solar farms that are created um, usually in a large uh, open space. And if you subscribe to it, you can, you're can um, you paying your money to this solar farm and then getting credits from the utility for the usage that's taken off. So in general, it's, it's usually about a 10% credit. Um, so that's a good way to utilize solar with, without actually having the panels on your facility. And, and th that's 10% uh, off your annual use. So it's not you know 10% off the price or your demand. So if, if you use 100,000 kilowatt hours a year with community solar, you will pay for 90,000 kilowatt hours a year. Now it's, that's, it's not exactly you know even every month, it's plus or minus, but it will average out typically by the end of the year to be a 10% reduction in your supply usage, which is big. I mean, everything adds up. Yeah, you can stand up. And so what I'm going to I'm going to talk about real quick here is um, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, big topic right now. Teslas, you know, BMW electric cars. You know, I think we got pickup trucks now that are electric. Um, there's there's a couple of different models. Um, you know, I try to compare EVC to green renewable energy. Um, it's something that if you believe in. Um, you can use it for your customer pool. You can also use it as marketing. Um, you know, just because, you know, some people will only go to places that have electric vehicle charging stations. You're seeing more of them. You can market it on your website, obviously. You know, you're coming off the throughway, the throughway, stop by for an hour, charge your car, get a beer, get a couple appetizers. You know, it's kind of, but it's not, you know, it's, it costs money for EV. It's not, you know, Oh, here, just pop it in and, you know, I can market it. So there's a couple of different models. The big one that's been going around in New York State um, is, is, the, is the free one. Hey, can I use two of your parking spots? I'm going to throw up two charging stations. I'm going to have a new meter set up for those two charging stations. Don't cost you nothing. You don't make any money off of it except for the fact that you can tell your customers and market to your customers that, hey, you can, you know, if you're traveling, stop in, you know, charge your car, a couple appetizers, a couple beers. Um, then there's, you know, profit sharing models where, you know, and right now that's a big, it's a big push for that because the incentives from NYSERDA are at its highest. Similar to how um, NYSERDA had incentives for commercial solar panels 10 years ago. Um, so a lot of people are going with the revenue sharing model where, you know, you get some of the incentives and then the difference you pay out of pocket. Um, it could be a 50-50 split on the revenue, 60-40 split, they tie it. So now those parking spots or those EV charging stations, let's say they take up two spots, they now become part of your meter. You may have to incre increase your voltage. I mean, mo most places have enough to handle it, um, but now they're tying back to that meter. And so you're, you're, you're paying for that electricity. So for an example, you know, if I have your electric, you know, I'm going to use Con Ed, for example, locked in at seven on the supply, and we know your delivery is a total of, 
you know, whatever, another five cents. So you're all in on your delivery and supply, soup to nuts, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. The average electric vehicle charging station, it costs for you to charge your car is between 35 and 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So you can make a nice penny depending on how many cars are stopping in and how many hours they're using. And then what a lot of our customers are doing is, instead of you know banking that in their pocket, they're just using it to offset the rest of their bill. So, um, so it's 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 big right now. I mean, it's it's an evolving technology. You know, you get the app, you put in the car. You know, Tesla's involved with all the models now. So you know, you put in the app and you can see, okay, um, who I can stop at Common Roots Brewing and charge my car or something like that. Or so, um, but it, it, it's a big thing right now. It's a big move. I think the cost of the cars are becoming a little bit more, you know, financially reasonable. So we're seeing more and more push for them. So, and I think there's a big tax break or tax credit when you buy them too, when you do your taxes. I personally think it's a good fit for a place like a brewery because you have to wait a certain amount of time for your char for your car to charge up. And what better to do than sit and have a beer? So brings in business. But don't drink and drive. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> Have your partner drive, you drink the beer. Um, so there's this thing called renewable energy credits. Um, so this is, uh, the states are actually purchasing these on your behalf, some of the states. New York state is considered a compliance instead of a voluntary state. What that means is they're purchasing these renewable energy credits on your behalf. These are credits that are given um, to help support uh, renewable resources within the state of New York. Um, it really is just a, a fraction of a cent that's added um, to your utility bill. Um, but also, if you wanted to go a step further and purchase extra renewable energy credits, that is an option as well. Um, just know that it does come with a little bit of an uptick on the cost because, again, we're talking green, we're talking renewable, it's more expensive. So I just want to add a little bit to this. So um, you do have, when, when you buy your electricity from the utility, and we're speaking about electricity specifically, um, no matter what, you're going to get, you know, a percentage of RECs into your electric with the utility. It's very, very tiny. Then you can also step outside and work with a company like us and buy straight renewables, um, either standard renewables, which, you know, they, most of it comes from Canada or down south, um, you know, a mix of solar, wind, and hydro. That, that's the generation that is offsetting those renewable energy credits for your price of electricity. Or you can buy New York State sourced renewable energy which is coming from you know, our local solar, wind, hydro, biomass. Um, but always keep in mind when you do that, um, I, I try to compare it to you know, when you go to Stop and Shop and you buy you know, apples, you have organic apples and you have your regular apples. And your organic apples are always more than the regular apples. It's the same thing with you know, green renewable energy. You're gonna pay a premium. I can tell you right now, before the pandemic, um, green renewable energy was probably about six tenths to eight tenths of a penny premium onto your standard electric price. Right now it's about a penny. And it just goes to show you the bigger push that you're seeing not just, you know, statewide renewable energy sources, but also, you know, throughout the country. So. <clears throat> Okay, so we talked a little bit about how to be more efficient, get your usage down, uh, be more sustainable, um, but what about actually being able to control your costs as well? Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, so there are a few different ways that you can um, assist with controlling your utility costs. Uh, this is kind of where we can heavily come in since we're an energy supplier. 
Um, if you're utilizing like the utility um, just for your supply at this time, um, you should know that you have other options. So when the market was deregulated back in the 1990s, it opened up uh, competition uh, for the consumers, which is better for the consumers. Uh, you don't have to just by default get your uh, energy supply from the utility. Um, you can get other options by utilizing an, an energy supply company um, or an ESCO, which is what we are considered. So with that comes options like locking in a rate um, for a contract term, um, so your energy supply rate doesn't go anywhere. And you know during times like these, uh, where we're seeing rates double and triple, if we're talking about electric um, from what we saw back in 2020, um, then that's definitely an option you might want to consider. Um, with the utility, you don't have that option. It's, you know, you're floating with the market, the highs and the lows. Uh, typically, you'll experience higher prices during uh, the more high demand months when you use your electricity and natural gas the most during the summer, during the winter for heating and cooling. Um, that's when you'll notice uh, the highest prices. Right now, if you've been paying attention to brewery uh, utility bills or even your home utility bills, uh, you might be feeling the stress on that. Um, it's just due to a number of different things that are going on um, out in the market that we can touch on a little bit. Um, but it definitely helps to you know, reach out to an energy supply company and see what your options are. Because um, if you can lock in something at a reasonable rate for a 12, 36, 48 month term, um, then you're not going to feel the stress and the volatility from the market prices. How many, how many of you guys um, are national grid? Your national grid gas. Yes. <laughs> um, Con Edison, how do you guys feel? <laughs> um, what about NYSEG? Okay. NYSEG, not that bad. I mean, your prices have gone up, but compared to NIMO, which is, which is not Niagara Mohawk upstate in national grid is through the roof. But, you know, in comparison, uh, NYSEG is not as bad. I think you guys are topping out at like between 9 and 11 cents right now on the high, where national grid Albany, Last month was 19 cents, which is insane. Um, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's Con Edison prices um, two years ago. Con Edison has been between 16 and 25 cents. Central Hudson, anybody Central Hudson? Where in Central Hudson? Which, which brewery? You're home. Okay, so you know. I mean, so Central Hudson, February, uh, topped out 21 and a half. So depending on where you are between January and February, you got to bill 16 cents, 17 cents. Gas is 73, 74 cents. Um, you know, so a, a big thing that I try to explain before, we're going to get into the soups and nuts about the market because, you know, let's say for an example, you live in Dutchess County. I, I live in Southern Dutchess by Pauling. So there's no natural gas over there, but my utility is NYSEC but I heat with oil. So what me and my wife do every, you know, August is I lock in my oil for the winter. Um, the same thing you can do with electric and your natural gas, but you can do that for a year or two years or six months or eight months, depending on the strategy and what we feel fits best for how your brewery uses energy and when they use energy. Um, same thing, you know, with uh, obviously oil, kerosene, propane. You can't do that with diesel or gasoline. You're going to buy that at will call. So right now, everybody's at the mercy. Um, you know, you, you probably, you know, if you're driving from Dutchess County up to Albany, I mean, depending, you know, you filled up your truck is a hundred bucks. I mean, easily. Well, hopefully she charged at her house and she had her rate fixed at six and a half cents, and she charged the car at six and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but, you know, for years, I want to say ever since mid 2000 to the end of 2015, the energy markets, whether if it's been propane, electricity, natural gas, the cost for renewables, it's been flat or low. A lot of people haven't felt pain. 
um, you know, our fixed rates were very, very low. I mean, I was fixing rates in Con Edison in 2016 at four cents a kilowatt hour. Con Ed was banging around between three and a half, and on a bad month, maybe six. I'm locking people in at three and a half, four. It was, it was a great deal. Um, then the pandemic hit. Then we had climate initiatives <coughs> kick in, okay? Which are good. I mean, listen, I'm not gonna speak foul on what we're trying to do for the country and for the world long term, but it costs money to do it. Um, and we can't push it too far too fast just because we don't, especially in New York State, we do not have the logistics to channel renewable energy. And the reason, we will eventually, but the reason being is if the five boroughs, if everybody in the five boroughs turns on their switch, it uses more power than the rest of the state of New York. But the power from the state of New York is where it comes from, the western part of the state. It's got to travel all the way, Bottles Neck in the Catskills, comes down, you know, through Albany, all the way down, you know, and it's got to travel till it gets to Westchester, the Bronx, Mount Vernon, Manhattan, Queens. Um, and you have to pay for that. And I t the best way I try to explain electricity is think of like, you know, you jump on the throughway, you get the little ticket, and then the farther you go when you hand in that ticket, that's the price of your toll. The farther you go, the higher your toll. So that's part of your cost, but also think about it, they were charging you if you were also sitting in traffic. And the traffic for electricity starts right below Albany getting into the Catskills. So now what's happening is, is Indian Point shut down officially in April. So now we got all this capacity that we need that was going to the five boroughs, which is Con Edison Zone J, Central Hudson, Dutchess County is zone G. Albany is zone F. So you had all, all this capacity. Where, where, where are we going to get it? Where's it going to come from? We had cricket open up in Dover Plains, picked up about 20% of Indian Point. We had another uh, generation plant open up in Monroe, picked up another 10. So we got like 60% that we're, not, we're at a loss right now. Now it's coming from generation plants in zone F. So now guess what happens? The cost of energy in zone F goes up to offset the capacity that's needed for zone J. So now zone J's prices go up as well, but they don't shoot up to 30 or 35 or 40 cents. If we didn't spread out that capacity for generation, that's what would happen down in Con Edison. And then Albany and Dutchess County and Ulster County and so forth would keep on going up, up and up. Um, so we're gonna show a couple of charts and, and, and kind of explain what that means, um, you know, visually so you can see. But when you fix your price, whether if it's electric, natural gas, or whatever commodity, you're looking for a price that is obviously gonna save you money. I mean, that's you're looking for something, a strategy that's gonna give you a savings opportunity. But you're also looking to get in at a time where you can take away market fluctuation at the best possible price that saves you the most money and gives you, you know, the ability to create some budget certainty. You know, if, if you know you use X amount of gallons of oil for this winter and you're paying 289 a gallon, there's your budget. Um, same thing with electricity, and that's where we come into play. Um, am I getting too confusing? Am I making sense? I'll let you talk about this chart a little. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll show a, a few charts just to kind of give you a visual of where the market is today and where it was. Um, they've talked a little bit about, you know, the difference between zones and where generation resources are located as opposed to where the demand is. Um, but, and I'll talk on a few other things that affect the pricing. Um, so you can see we're on an uptick right now, and this is for um, this is for natural gas, but the, the electric one look, looks very similar. Um, so there are a number of things that affect a price, um, and I'll talk on a few of them. Weather is a big one, um, so especially with natural gas, because you're relying on what type of winter you have to see what rates you're going to have to expect. Um, now. In New York, we're pretty much used to having cold winters. That's really no surprise. 
um, it's how cold the winter is. And this past winter, we've had a pretty cold winter, so you have to take that into effect. And also the amount of actual natural gas that we have in storage as well. But because we had a, a very cold winter, there's been some pretty big withdrawals from natural gas, um, which leads to a storage low. So you have that. Um, that decreases supply and increases demand. Um, if you take a look at where we were back in 2020, actually electric and gas rates were great, but reason being is because demand was pretty low. You know, a lot of businesses were closing up because of quarantine, um, and because of that reason, we had some pretty cushy energy prices. But now the world is opening back up, you know, um, trying to get back to some type of a norm after COVID-19. Businesses are resurging again, demand is up, but supply is down. So it's supply and demand that really affect where your prices are gonna go and what affects supply and demand, which is weather, like I mentioned. Politics is another big one. That's huge right now. You know, you've got Russia, Ukraine, all Putin's fault, um, but you know, that's, that's really affecting our pricing right now because, you know, Europe does not have access to Russia's supply anymore. So where are they gonna get it from? They have a shortage, they get it from the US. Um, the US is expected to be uh, one of the main exporters of natural gas by 2023. And this is one of the reasons. Um, not only the politics overseas, but also, you, you know, you've got Biden's uh, political goals um, for utilizing as much renewable resources as possible in the United States. And as we know, that comes at a cost as well. Um, add in some natural disasters. Um, I mean, you've all heard about uh, the disaster in Texas just because of the way that they had their grid set up. Um, and then also the hurricanes. Hurricane Ida had a number of rigs that were flooded or underwater, so we don't have access to that supply at that time. Can, uh, I, can I step in? Yeah. So she, she brought up something good, Texas, last winter. So last winter was, was, wasn't too bad of a winter. I mean, it was cold, but it was, you know, what we consider almost a mild winter. Um, Texas got hit really, really hard. Texas is a very renewable state. Um, big on solar and wind. They froze out, their solar panels were covered in snow, their wind turbines froze, and their price of electricity went from four cents to nine cents in a day. I mean, in hours. Um, they didn't have enough backup capacity to offset the renewable generation that wasn't coming. So that cannot ever happen in New York, ever. The reason that happened in Texas is because the way they had their grid set up, they were trying to avoid um, federal uh, regulations, basically. And federal regulations, which we are regulated by, which is called FERC, um, states that you know we have to have our equipment winterized. So because they went around that and thought, we have all this supply, we can just use our own supply without relying on other grids to supply us in an emergency, we can go around federal regulations and we don't have to winterize our stuff. So because of that, you know, they had that freeze out, they didn't have anything winterized, so everything went to crap. So that was, you know, the main reason that Texas happened the way it did. Sorry, Dave. No, 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 that's fine. Um, you know, another couple of big, you know, big things to touch on here is, you know, th this chart here is, is, is what we're looking at at the Henry Hub futures, what natural gas trades on. And you can see how the futures change um, the more and more we got out of 2020. That's what we base our pricing strategies on. Um, it's almost similar to, you know, whether if you're trying to buy, you know, crypto on Coinbase um, or you're, you know, trading on the stock market. You're looking to try, you're trying to buy low, right? Um, so if you could find a low time in the market, so like right now my job for my customers, whether if it's a renewing customer or a new customer, is when there's a dip in the market or a, a low in the market on the future side, not what the spot is today, but on the futures, that's when I can go out, look at their energy usage, hedge it and find the price and lock it in for them. Um, 
But as you can see, there's a big difference of what we saw in the end of 2020 going into 2021. And we'll see the exact same thing here with electric. Okay. So, um, you Yeah, that's perfect. We, we only have a little bit left, so. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So, this is the electric chart. Looks pretty similar to the natural gas. Um, electric and natural gas go pretty much hand in hand. So, if you're having, um, you know, a rise in natural gas prices, uh, you know, due to Russia exports, you know, everything that I listed then you're most likely going to see a rise in electric prices as well. And why would that be? Um, the reason is because natural gas is a large generating source of electricity. So if you have high prices with natural gas, then it's gonna flow over to electricity prices as well. Um, another thing I wanna to touch on because it's a large uh, component of an electric price is capacity. Um, so there is a capacity portion of your electric rate that basically is there to just ensure that your local utility um, always has enough, on, enough energy on hand to supply to you. Um, and your capacity tag is measured the previous year on the hottest day of the year where it's the highest peak demand. Um, there are programs available and they're best suited for um, large energy users that kind of manip can manipulate this. Um, they're called demand response programs. So if you're involved in one of these demand response programs and say you have an operation that is able to shut down um, a good amount of your uh, usage during a peak usage time, usually it's like the hottest day of the year, um, then you can kind of manipulate the, your capacity price. Um, but if you're involved in, in one of those programs, you know, it's, it, and you can do that, um, then it's beneficial. But again, it's best suited for large energy users. Honestly, the capacity market I could present on for a whole day. So just to, you know, give you a few points on that. And, and when we talk capacity, and just to keep this simple, this is your capacity is your KW, or your demand. So if you notice on your utility bill, it's split up into the delivery and the supply. Your delivery should always be higher than your supply. Um, but the biggest cost component of your delivery is your KW or demand, and that's your capacity cost. And that your capacity tag gets set every year. It's effective May of every year. and. We, we usually know what your new cap tag is going to be end of March, or early April. Um, if it's flat or lower, that's a good sign because that means your demand is going to decrease. And hence, your KW will decrease, meaning your delivery will drop a little bit. So um, let's tie it in. So we, we, we definitely want to do a Q&A. Just one thing before we go into a Q&A, it's... You know, my, my wife said it the other day before I left here for Albany, she's like, you know, sweetie, are, are we going into an, an oil-driven recession? You know, I can't answer that yet. I don't know. I mean, oil, petroleum went through the roof the other day. It's, it's down like 5%, 10% in the last two days. She said, don't spend too much money in Albany. We're going to go into a recession. It's, you know, everybody's pa panicking and, and getting emotional and, and reacting. And, you know, our job is to be proactive with the energy markets. We're prepared. We always knew something like this could happen, um, but you know, it's it's. If you're looking at your bills, don't just look at your bills because oh wow, why is my bill a thousand bucks and it's usually five hundred. You should always look at your bills, um, regardless of what it is. Is it the, is it the same every month because you fix your price? Is it the same every month because you're on budget billing? Is it the same every month because um, you know you locked in a rate with a supplier or somebody like that? But um, regardless, you know Central Hudson billing issues. We went through new account numbers, estimated meter reads versus actual meter reads. Are they really reading your meter? I can before we go into a Q and A. I want to tell you a horror story that turned out to be really, really good at the end of the day. But I have a brewery in Queens that, you know, I was looking at his gas bills every month and I'm like, 
you know, th this is like natural gas for a studio apartment in Soho. This makes no sense. And I'm like, they're probably not reading your meter. It, it's going to happen one day. Sure enough, a year and a half later, he calls me up. He's like, National Grid read my meter. I got a bill for 145 grand. So I'm not going to say we're a brewery, but hey, listen, we, we spoke. We called up National Grid together. You know, all of us, a brew, uh, uh, the utility can't just all of a sudden make up usage for months, you know, 18 months ago. It's just impossible. So they were, you know, they were billing him for almost 22 months of usage, but 10 of those months were estimated made up numbers when they weren't even fully operational. So we got it knocked down from, I think, 140 to like 70 grand and then just budgeted out for two years. Still, we cut it down pretty good, but it was inevitable. They're going to get their money regardless. It's just a question of how bad do you want to bite the bullet. So, um, you know, that's what we're here for. But just look at your bills. Look at it, whether if it's oil. Uh, I was speaking to a facility manager the other day, and he was buying his on and off road diesel from a place. And he never looked at the price he was paying because it's on call. You know, you just buy your diesel and that's it. So, so. That's easy. Listen, energy is, it's, it's a cost you guys pay, but it's not like the most fancy, crazy thing to talk about. Most people don't want to talk about energy and they only want to talk about it is when they're pissed at how much they're paying. You know, we like to talk about it when it's low and when it's high, so. But thank you guys for coming. Can I ask you one question? Yeah, yeah, sure. There's one, there's one thing, right, that you walk into any brewery and recommend that you do. I know that you have a list of like, the classic conservation um, techniques, but are there things that you guys have seen in the past that you like one quick thing that you could do that you could sort of lean towards starting down the path towards more sustainable? Um, I would say uh, the first step uh, would be just like really analyzing how you use your energy and you know what might work best uh, for you, uh, whether it be in locking in an energy plan or even just having an analysis done on efficiency in your building. Um, I know uh, I've heard that the, the community solar has been effective as well, getting that set up um, if you have that um, nearby. Um, but I think just first taking a look at how you use your energy and then figuring out, out from there. Um, we have a number of advisors that work with David and I. Um, they'll go on site, they'll take a look at your bills, um, they'll take a look at your utilization and then just figure out a plan from there. But just being aware is probably the most important thing. And I got a very easy one that's totally free. In the summertime when you're blowing air conditioning like crazy, don't keep your windows or doors open. Don't let you, you don't have many times I stop by brewery, brew pub, restaurant, whatever, and you know, it's July 28th, it's 95 degrees out, central air is blowing, and you know, the kitchen windows open, the tap room windows open, the front door is swinging wide open. That is just, take the cash register and throw it out the window. You're not, you don't see it as much in the next bill, but in your demand and your capacity tag that gets set, you're gonna feel it heavy. So that's probably the simplest thing that I can tell you to do. I see everybody doing it. And if you are a farm brewer's license, um, there's a document that you can attach to electric fixed pricing that makes you tax exempt from the supply of energy. So, but you have to have a farm brewer's license. Um, some people have both. As long as you have the farm brewer's license, um, you are considered a farm because I think now 60%, I think it's 60 or 90% of your ingredients has to be New York State sourced. So I have to give you New York State green energy, but if we price it right, we hopefully we can get it competitive enough and then you can get your sales tax exempt, so. so, so what has been the, um, the bill, the, the The sales tax would be yes on the supply portion of the bill. Uh, I mean, it depends. I mean, it's what eight and eight percent and change, depending on where you are. I mean, Newburgh's eleven percent or something like that. City of it depends on where you are. So, of your supply cost. Sales tax exempt to farm Yes. 
Yep. Is that, sorry, is oh. that because you locked in your prices, you said, that's the only way to get that exception? It's because you are you're a, so you're a New York Farm Brewers license, um, and now we're sourcing green renewable energy. I'll probably do like 25% green renewable. New York State source green renewable energy, and then there's a form. I believe it's the ST 121, um, and then I attach that to the utility, and then it makes you exempt from sales tax on the supply. We have that form if if you'd like to acquire that. Yep. But that's only if you lock in your rate? Correct, yes. I mean, you, you, you could do it on a variable rate with a supplier, um, but I would never recommend that. And one follow on, is there a way for us to find out where the community solar farms are? I mean, I can tell you, I'm sure everybody here has probably been approached by a community solar company. I mean, if you had, Con Ed's rough. I don't, I don't think there's many in Con Ed, but I know Central Hudson, Albany, Syracuse, Utica, Rome. I mean, they're all over the place. I don't think there's any in Con Ed yet. Is anybody here using community solar? All right. Uh, and how's it worked out good? I think so. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but... A couple of years ago, community solar was kind of controversial because it had to be separately billed. And so now it's like a whole nother bill and you got to match the credit. It was a pain in the butt. Now community solar, the credit is directly billed on your bill. So I tell everybody, if you haven't done it, do it, whatever. It's a free 10%, 8%, whatever it is, you do it. We do, we do a lot of it. So if you ever want help with it, we can do it through an affiliated partner. But I can only do it pretty much national grid National Grid, NYSEG, and RG and E. I can't do it in Central Hudson, O and R, or Con Ed, which are the hardest to do it in. Um, and it's only for certain service classifications. Um, so large, large breweries, um, for an example, and I'm trying to use Con Ed as an example, but a large, most breweries are EL nines or large commercial service class nine in Con Edison. I think it's an SC two in National Grid, but if you fall below that, you, those type of accounts are, it's not applicable. You can't do community solar because you're too big for the load, so. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, Thank much appreciated.